Our text today will be in Isaiah 36, so if you'd like to turn there, same passage we were reading there for our responsive reading. Again, as I've done the last five so sermons, I'm going to remind us of our, of our uh, central verse to this series is Isaiah 6.8. It says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I was thinking as I prepared this message that many times when we hear that verse or many times when we consider doing anything for God, uh, we respond with the phrase, I'm not perfect, but I do the best I can. I'm not perfect, but I do the best I can. And nobody's perfect, but I'm doing the best I can. And about serving God. That's a terrible phrase as far as salvation goes, but it's also a terrible phrase as far as serving God goes. I'm not perfect, but doing the best I can. That's not what I'm asking about. That's not what God's asking about with this kind of call. Really, this boils down to an easy speech <laughs> is, do you want to do what is right? Amen. That's what I'm naming today's sermon. Do you want to do what is right? That's what God wants to know. Yes. He's not looking for the perfect person. He's not, he's not going to find the perfect person. Um, and He doesn't want you just saying, you know, I'm just trying to do the best I can. Are you trying to do what is right or not? That will guide you. If your whole life will be guided um, well by Scripture, by prayer, by God's Word, if you approach life as, I want to do the right thing, and I'm in, I'm in, I'm in for the right thing. Even if it's hard, even if it's difficult, I will do the right thing. Today I want to preach about that. I want to look at a man who wanted to do what was right. That's the prerequisite for doing anything of any kind of consequence in this life. What holds people up um, from doing, from serving God, what holds people up in life is not that um, they don't know what's right, it's that they don't want to do right. In fact, everything we'll cover today are probably things that we've all heard. We've all heard probably a hundred different times. And so the question is, is it a knowledge problem? No, it's a choice to do what's right or not. In Isaiah 36 and verse 1 is where I'd like to take it up. I want to introduce you, I'm sure you've heard of him before, but a man, a king called Hezekiah in Isaiah 36. And you'll note that I've skipped quite a few chapters this time from our last um, sermon, but I wanted to get to this passage. I believe God would have me get to this passage for this morning. Because here Isaiah partners with a man who wants to do what's right, and it's amazing. You've heard a lot of these other chapters where Isaiah is just preaching on, uh, to deaf ears. No one's listening to him. Well, he's got a man in Hezekiah that wants to do what's right. And when you get a preacher partnered with people who want to do what's right, God's work gets done. You see things happen in families, in churches, in lives. Things get done when that marriage is met. It's bad when you have somebody who wants to do what's right, but they can't find a preacher who wants to preach what's right. And it's bad when you find a preacher who wants to preach what's right, but no one wants to do what's right. Mary, that's the two things together. God's work gets done. And here you have the combination of Isaiah and Hezekiah. Um, look at verse 1 with me. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of the, king, of the king Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto king Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool and the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over his house, and Sheb Shebna the scribe, and Joah, Asa's son, the recorder. I want to tell you this morning that Hezekiah, and I'm going to tell you his backstory in a second, but Hezekiah is a man who wants to do what's right. He's a good man. He wants to do, he wants to do what's right. And I want to tell you, here comes the enemy. When someone wants to do what's right, the enemy will follow, will confront the Bible says in Isaiah 59, 15, it says, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. I want to tell you, Christian friend, have you, have you never faced a foe? Well, if you never want to face a foe, then don't do it right. Um, you'll never face a foe. That, that foe won't meet you at the gate to confront you because you don't want to do what's right <laughs> anyway. So if you want to, uh, that kind of peaceful life, if you never want to face a foe, then just never join the fight. Never decide to do what's right. But I also will tell you, if you do you want to waste your whole life? Then uh, never join the fight. Never do what's right. That's how you waste a life. 
So don't be scared. But here, Hezekiah wants to do what's right, and here the world sends a foe right in front of his face, a formidable foe. I'm going to show you this guy, this, um, this king of Assyria is huge, the dominant power of the time, and this, um, this governor, whoever you want to call this captain, Rabshakeh, he's no pushover himself. Here he comes to threaten um, the remnant that, that are living here in Judah. Look at verse 4. And Rabshakeh said to them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, Sayest thou, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust, that thou rebellest against me? When that foe comes up in your life, in this world, the foe is going to wonder one thing. It's the same thing that Satan wonders. It's, where is your confidence? What are you trusting in? Because if Satan, if the wickedness in this world, the principalities and powers that rule this world, if they can pinpoint where your confidence is, and if it's in something other than God, then they can take it away. Your life can be destroyed, Christian friend. If Christian friend, if your confidence is in your career, that, well, that's the devil's that's the devil's thing. He can take away. The, the devil is the god of this world. That's why Christians who trust in uncertain riches, who trust in uncertain relationships in this world, un trust in uncertain um, pleasures and things that get us by, those things can be taken away. The devil wants to know who are you trusting in. What are you trusting in? Because if it's not in God, then you are going to be a mincemeat. You're an easy target to destroy your life. He wants to know, what are you trusting in? What do you have confidence in, Christian friend? All the more reason to have confidence and to trust in the right thing. We'll see what that is in a second. He says in verse, uh, verse 6, Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to do all that trust in him. This Rabshakeh, he's a man, he's got some smarts. He says, if you're trusting in Egypt, Egypt's going to let you down. Egypt is what we've talked about in previous weeks. Egypt is a type of the world. And the devil comes to you, and the devil knows the world's going to let you down. This whole life you've built and the stability you have that's based on the relationships you have with your family, friends, relatives, it's a uh, shaky ground. It's not a steadfast rock for you to count on in troubled times, and the enemy knows it. It says in verse 7, But if thou say unto me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high place and who altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar? The enemy is also wondering, what kind of God do you trust in? And the enemy doesn't really know what kind of God we can trust in. The enemy just sees the, outs, the external things in life. So it's like you're taking away high places, taking away altars, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this enemy thinks that you don't even have your God to trust in. We'll find out Reb Shaka is going to be rudely awakened to the truth of who Hezekiah is trusting in here in a second. Well, this is a setup. I want to set this up with the, the foe and what will the foe do when it comes um, to attack those who want to do what's right and Hezekiah does. He's telling him you can't trust these things by, it says, by the time it says in verse... Um, let's go down a few to... 9. How then wilt thou turn away the face of the captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? And now, and I am now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it. The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. This is Rabshakeh still talking. I'm sorry, I skipped a little context there. Rab, Rabshakeh is still talking to these men, still trying to get them to doubt. And here in verse 10, the enemy even goes as far as to say, He says, says Don't you, th he says, You think I'm up here without God on my side? Reb Shaka claims to have God on his side. He says that God actually led me up here to destroy this land and take it over. <laughs> He's in their heads. He's got these men, these, these poor men have gone out to meet the enemy and talk it over for King Hezekiah. And this Reb Shaka is in their heads. He says, you can't trust the world. You can't trust in your God. In fact, God is on my side. The foes in this world will try to make us doubt everything. Even doubt the God we serve. 
The world will say, you know what, that God you have in that Bible, you take him very literally. And he's not like that. You know, God is just more this God that I've created. And actually, God's on my side. And God, God isn't in church. God's not in the Bible. God's just more of this fluffy guy in a cloud that I've, I've concocted. They make us doubt. Oh, maybe you are right. Maybe God, maybe God isn't the God that actually believes and teaches that we should obey God's word. Maybe God isn't the God that says that sin is real and we should get away from it. Maybe God isn't the God that created a real heaven and a real hell. The world will make us want to doubt this true God. My, the main core of my sermon today is don't let the world make you doubt that God, to put it bluntly. But here he says, in verse, um, let's look down at verse uh, 10, or verse 11. Then said Eliakim and Shebna, and Joel unto Rabshaka, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. And speak not unto us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. These men, these guys have gone out to talk with the enemy. They say, hey, let's just talk in the Syrian language just between ourselves. Because the children here, these, these men who have gone out for Hezekiah, they don't want all the men back on the walls, the soldiers, to hear all these things. All these things that are going to make them doubt and fear and tremble and, and run for the hills. But I want to tell you, look at Reb Shaka. He's not a nice man. The enemy is not a nice enemy. The devil wants you to doubt everything in life, everything about this word. The devil wants you to tuck tail and run. And who does he target? He targets those who are most inclined to tuck tail and run. Right now, if there's someone in this congregation right now who is at a point in their lives where they're having to decide, well, is the Bible true or not? Well, the devil's targeting you. Right now, if there's someone in this congregation who's having to decide, you know, does God use the local church in the New Testament age or not? Right now, he's targeting you with that doubt. He wants you to go live a life outside of church the rest of your life or outside in some wishy-washy church the rest of your life and waste your life. Rab Shaka is going to target the weak ones. He says in verse 12, those on the fence, verse 12 says, But Rab Shaka said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and... And to thee, to speak these words, hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? That Rabshakeh, then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. And I want to go back here and talk about who Hezekiah is. He's a man that wants to do what's right. But people might already be doubting him because some of the things that he's done, they're drastic. Some of the people, some of the soldiers up on the wall right now might be looking for reason to doubt Hezekiah. And the devil knows that. The enemy knows that. Already they're targeting, number one, they're targeting Hezekiah, the leader. He's saying, you cannot trust that man. You cannot trust that man of God. That man who wants to do what's right, he cannot help you. And the enemy comes, when foes come against Christians, especially Christians who may be a little bit on the fence, the enemy will target those who actually want to do what's right. He'll knock them down. You shouldn't listen to this person. 15. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered in the hand of the king of Assyria. He says, Don't let that man of God tell you to just, just trust the Lord. I've told that the people in this congregation, I've said, Well, we just need to trust God. We just need to trust God. And I say it, hopefully not robotically, but maybe sometimes we hear it robotically. You say, oh, uh, Pastor Logan's just going to say the same thing. We need to trust God. <laughs> it could come to that point. The devil wants you to stop believing that. He wants us to stop saying that. 16, hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me and eat every one of his vine and every one of his fig tree and drink ye every one of the waters of his own cistern. If you just forsake God, forsake those who want to do what's right, your life is actually going to work out better, says the devil, says the foe. You're going to be better off. Find things in life that really fulfill you, make you happy when you get away from God's word. The devil tempts us all in different ways, and I simply ask you to plug it into your own head. How might the devil tempt you? with the treasures of this world, which are fleeting. 17. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, your life will be so much better off if you just stop trusting God. Realize how ridiculous that sounds for me to even say it? 
But that's exactly what the devil's telling you. That's exactly what the world is telling you. You will be so much better off if you stop believing in that archaic book, going to those old-fashioned services, singing those old hymns, hearing that simple man up there talking some simple truths that are 200 years late. Excuse me, 200 years removed. 18. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying the Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Beware of that person trying to persuade you, change you dramatically, into a new creature, into a person with new priorities, new purpose in life. The devil will warn us, the devil will tell us that it hasn't worked out for others. I mean, what do we, in verse 18, it's like one of those calls that say, do you think you're so special? That God you have is actually going, you're going to be able to trust that God for your needs in your life? Well, other people have done that and their lives have fallen apart. Now, that may be the case, but if it were the case, they weren't trusting in the right God. Your God is not going to allow your life to fall apart. Your God is what holds your life together. When we walk away from God, Christian friend, when we walk away from God's word, Christian friend, that's when life unravels. That's what's at stake. The devil wants to get us to think the exact opposite, though. It's this Bible that's holding you back. It's that local church holding you back. It's that crazy preacher holding you back from achieving your true happiness. It's all a lie. People who want to do what's right, they face foes. They face foes. That's what I want to talk about this morning. Let's look down to verse um, 19. Let's read it all in stride. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? I don't know how to say that. And ha have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, Answer him not. This last plea, he says that your God is no different than any other God. All these other lands have fallen underneath the might of Syria, and you're going to fall too. Well, they don't know Hezekiah's God. They don't know your God. They don't know the God of the Bible. Think about the devil himself. The devil himself is still on this crazy, whimsical idea that his rebellion is somehow going to work out. When God has already declared in Scripture that it's not. But he's still rebelling. He still thinks that they're going to win, and they're not. The world thinks that same thing. They doubt the power of Almighty God, the very creator of the universe. We shouldn't doubt. Here in verse 21, I love these, these men. They answer him not a word. Why? Because Hezekiah said that would be best. Hezekiah said, don't answer my word. Sometimes in life, when we face formidable foes, it's best just to turn and walk away. And you're looking at a man who, I don't run from fights. That's not, well, I'm not saying anything other than that. I'd be welcome to contend for the faith if God so led. We would look at scripture and contend together. But I want to tell you sometimes, that's not what Christians are called to do. Sometimes Christians are called to knock off the dust and walk away. And especially, I would tell you this, sometimes when we're younger Christians, and sometimes when we are naive, maybe about who may be a friend or a foe, a young Christian at this point may say, well, you know, maybe we need to try to lead Rabshakeh to the Lord. And I, I love the sentiment, I do. But the foe we face is fierce. The devil will come to you in a smiling character. It could be your most loving relative you have. The most friendliest face you have will come to you. And their father could be the, is the devil. If they're not saved, their father is the very Satan himself. And that smiling face could destroy your life. So it makes no sense. And Hezekiah tells these men, don't tarry. Don't talk with these men. Walk away from it. No, we don't need to try to lead Rabshakeh to the Lord. Rabshakeh is trying to destroy you. <laughs> we must keep that in our forefronts of our mind, Christian friends, in this young church, that we want to bring, um, we do, we talked about a Wednesday night, we want to bring the gospel right and knock down the gates of hell. We do, and by God's grace, with God's power, we can go into the world and be on the offense. But we have to remember, Christian friends, that there's an opposing team, an opposing force, trying to destroy you, you, you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. 
If you, Christian friend, are someone who wants to do what's right, and I trust we all are, the devil wants to destroy you, and he will send a foe your way. I want to talk about now, though, and we'll come back to the, to the end of this story, but I want to look a little bit about who was Hezekiah. I keep saying he was a man who wanted to do right, right? But what does that look like? Let's, let's, let's see what that looks like. And I also want to talk about how doing right is what leads him to exactly where he needs to be, to who he needs to be at this point in time. That allows this outcome to actually work out okay, even though it looks, it looks terrible, does it not? Let's look at how Hezekiah became right for this moment. And why should the people, his followers, his nation, listen to him? Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 29. This sermon I thought about, you could do a whole series on Hezekiah. Really one of the most interesting stories, I think, of kings named in the Chronicles. It's a kind of neat segue from Isaiah after he does a bunch of prophecy to get into a story here right around 700 B.C. But please look at 2 Chronicles chapter 29. I want to do a few, pull in a few verses here and there out of different chapters just to show who um, Hezekiah is. Let's look at 29, uh, verse 1. And again, thinking through, what do I mean somebody wants to do what's right? Well, this is what it looks like. Hezekiah 29, verse 1. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 5 and 20 years old. So 25-year-old starts to reign then. And he reigned 9 and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. So as I've said, Hezekiah is one of the good kings. There weren't a lot of good kings, but he was one of them. He wanted to do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And this is what it looks like. Verse 3, He in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. I've got some simple notes here because I'm a simple man, but by God's grace and God's power, I trust that they're what he once said. But when you want to do what's right, when you want to do what's right in your life, Christian friend, you put God's house first. I know you're saying, you're saying that, Logan, because you started a church and you want people to get on board. I'm saying it because I believe it's what the Scriptures teach. The Bible says in the New Testament, it says, Forsake not the assembling yourselves together, as the manner of some is. The Bible throughout the New Testament, for those who doubt the role of the local church, I, I must remind some people in our world that the New Testament is filled with what? Epistles. Letters to churches and from churches. It's how God's work is done. And yes, we're all believers, and yes, we're all um, saved, and we're all into the same body of Christ, but God uses local assemblies to accomplish His work. I tell you, when we do God's work, we want to do what's, what's right, we put God's house first in our lives. And it's not a second, third, fourth. You notice that His very first thing He did in the first year of His reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. This is kind of like priority number one. You know, like when you get a new president, he says, the first thing I'm going to do the first year of my uh, um, term, I'm going to do this. Well, this is what was on his mind. We need to get God's house centered, fixed up in our lives, repaired. It says now, let us look at verse um, 4. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of this place. This I think can preach on a number of different levels, including getting God's house in order, God's house done in God's way, not making it a den of thieves, a house of merchandise, as I preached last week in parts, but also in our Christian lives, getting filth out of the way. In Sunday school, did we not just cover how Moses was called to go redeem and lead the children out of Israel? Children of Israel, out of Israel. Out of Egypt, excuse me. But before Moses could begin his job of being that deliverer, what did he have to do? He had failed to obey God in the rules of circumcision, remember? And God was about to smite him. Before we serve God, we have to get sin and filth out of the way. And I don't mean you're going to become perfect and then serve God, because it ain't never going to happen. But I mean you have to get out of gross sin. Yes. Gross lifestyles of sin. You have to get out of them. You can't do it. You cannot be a perpetual, living in perpetual adultery and say, I'm just going to give my life to the Lord. He can't use you. You cannot live in that homosexual lifestyle and say, I'm saved, I'm going to give my life to the Lord. It ain't going to happen. One, you, you can't be saved. 
I mean, it's a testament that you're not saved if you're living such a lifestyle. Get the filthiness out of the way. You want to do what's right? Get filthiness out of the way first. Please skip down. I'm going to skip some verses. 11 says, My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before Him and to serve Him, that ye should minister unto Him and burn incense. I want to talk some pretty Christian 101 things today about don't be negligent. Don't be negligent to God's work. Negligent is defined as failing to take proper care in doing something. That means God gives you something to do. You see it in Scripture. You're not negligent to it. You don't neglect it, right? You take care of it, proper care to do so. If you neglect your children, it means you know, you're not feeding your kids, you're not clothing your kids. You're neglecting that obligation you have. And Christian friend, where are you neglecting what God's called you to do? Are you even neglecting things, speaking of feeding yourself, or feeding, are you neglecting to read God's Word? Don't be negligent. Don't be starving yourself during the week. Uh, Sunday morning sermons are nice, hopefully, but they cannot fill your belly throughout the week. You will starve yourself if you're not in God's Word on your own. Don't be negligent to God's work, including the work of the local church. Look at 29 verse 36. It says, in, and I skipped a bunch there, but there's a bunch of cool things that happen between there and there, but for sake of time, we'll go to 36. And Hezekiah rejoiced and all the people that God had prepared the people for the thing was done suddenly. This morning, our opening exercise, I talked about not just obedience, but obedience immediately. Obedience immediately. There's, I don't know what it is. It's, it's a misnomer. It's a falsehood. I grew up with it. It was in my head for years and years and years and years and years. You hear sermons, and you're sitting in the pew, right? Um, or you hear truth during the week, and it's going through your head. But let's talk about this. You hear a sermon, you're sitting in the pew, and you decide, you know, it's a decision kind of sermon, making you decide something. You're contemplating in your head. And as you're contemplating, you decide, yeah, you know, I'm going to work towards this. I'm going to start doing this thing a little bit better. I'm going to, like, gradually progress into obedience. My point, my point I'm trying to get to is that obedience is, uh, should be a sudden thing. A sudden thing. It's like the day you decided that church, like attending church, was biblical. I know I'm know i on that vein this morning for some reason. The day you decided attending church was bi biblical, you didn't say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of ease into it. I'm gonna first going to, Sunday mornings, I'm going to start turning on my car. I'll turn on the car, but then I'll turn it off and I'll go back inside. I'll, I'll do that first step. I'll turn it I'll get in the car, and then I'll drive to the parking lot. It'll be in the parking lot, I mean, gradually, but then I'll go back home. And eventually I'll get in that door. <laughs> now you get the point, right? But you didn't ease into obeying God's word to be in church on Sunday morning. You don't ease your way out of sin. Now, I know this is difficult because there are sins that bind you. I know that. There are sins that, that, that control your mind. But you don't ease your way. You're going to say, okay, I'm just going to sin five times today instead of the ten. And then I'll cut myself down to four, three, or two. You make a decision. And you make a sudden change in your life. That's how Christian work should be. That's how the Christian life should be. God gives us the power. The Holy Spirit gives us the power for dramatic change. And it's a testimony. You understand? That's the difference between a true Christian and the unsaved. The true Christian, you can see them become a new creature in two seconds. And then all the friends are saying, what happened to my friend? He doesn't want to party anymore like me. Completely different priorities, different person. Whatever happened to you? You got brainwashed by something, right? You joined some cult somewhere and all of a sudden I don't recognize you. Well, that's how it should be. Things that are gradual, God doesn't work through, I mean, you can grow, and don't get me wrong, you grow in the Lord, and that can be gradual throughout your life, grow in the Lord, that's gradual. But these changes in obedience to Scripture, they're not gradual. That's the world's fixes. The world is that, you know, they got programs like um, AA, and they got these self-help things um, that gradually get people to, you know, turn, turn, turn the corner. There, right? Well, God's work is one calling for obedience, so you see things that are done suddenly. And what does it come down to? You choosing that you want to do what's right. If you walk out of the door, if you walk away from sermon saying, you know what, the pastor hit something that I know was speaking to me, and I'm just going to gradually kind of work on that thing. You know what decision that is? That's a decision not to do what's right. That's what, that's what you've determined. I did it as, it's through years and years of sitting in pews myself. As a teenager, I can remember that decision. You know what, that's exactly what I need to hear. That's exactly what I need to change. And you know, that's cool. I'm, I'm gonna, I, might, I might work on that a little bit. You kind of applaud the minister. And, <laughs> no, you didn't make a decision. 
That's what's good about, and I know we have altar calls here, we're old fashioned style, but that's, what's, that's what that's for, is to make a decision right then. You can make a decision right this very second in your head, and I, I encourage you to do so, but that's why you do it. That's why churches were brought up this way, so that people, before you walk back out the door and you forget about everything that was, God was touching your heart on, you make a decision, you purpose your heart that I'm going to make that change. That's a lot to say about just that simple topic of what they did was sudden in Hezekiah's reign. He got the country turned upside down in a hurry. I'll say that about a lot of things in your life. You want to decide to read your Bible more? Don't warm up to it. Just start reading your Bible more. You want to decide, um, I wrote down some different things, to seek God in your life, then just decide to start seeking God. You wake up tomorrow, find God. Through prayer, through Bible um, reading, ask God what you want to do, uh, what you're supposed to do that day. You get right with God by making a sudden, abrupt change to your life. That's a simple point. Okay, look down at 30 and verse 8. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. That verse packs a punch, but I just wanted to pull out the fact that don't be stiff-necked. Kind of related to what we were just saying, but stubbornness is just another way of saying you don't want to do what's right. You want to stay the way you are. Always been this way, always have been. Hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Stop being stubborn. Let the Word of God transform your life. It should be transforming your life. It should be renewing your mind. It's a bad state, and we're all guilty of it. But approaching your Bible reading time, approaching your, your church service, um, with a heart that says, not even that, with a heart that's not longing to be changed. When we open God's Word, we should be longing to be transformed. When we come through the doors, even in this simple little church, with this simple little pastor, we should be longing to be changed. The prayer should be, Lord, help that pastor through some miraculous superpower that you have. Help that preacher tell me what I actually need to hear. Help him do it. Even if it steps on my toes, help that pastor change my life in the way it needs to be changed. You know what? There's power in prayer. and There's power in prayer in the pews. I believe that. I always said that's one lesson I learned through my years. And I was, whatever, you know, 30 years in a pew. I learned that praying for the pastor is some of the best things you can do to help your own life. You want him to preach what you need to hear, pray for him. I totally believe it. There's power in prayer, and especially praying for the preacher, whoever it may be. It's not just um, pastors. Tonight, Brett will be preaching, so pray for him then. It says, don't be stiff-necked. If you look at verse 9, it says, for if you turn again to the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away His face from you if you return unto Him. We must always remember that when we turn to God, we will find Him gracious and merciful. God is unfailing in that regard. God is consistent. We never have to worry. You know, sometimes in life you have that worry. Let's say like you've got an argument with your spouse and sometimes you have that worry. Well, I'm going to apologize, but you know, what if they come back and say that, you know, I don't care? Or what if there's this brother in the church, I'm going to apologize and they're just going to throw it back in my face and not accept it. You know, in the world you have that worry, don't you? With God, you don't have it. With God, you have that faithful friend who's absolutely ready every single time to be gracious and merciful when you turn to Him. We should never lose that. Never lose that thought. We should just simply turn to Him. Look at verse uh, 16, if you would, please. I know I'm just picking out different favorite lines from different verses, but 16 says, And they stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received at the hand of the Levites. It says in verse 16, I underlined it in my Bible, they stood in their place. When you want to do what's right for God, you start standing where God puts you. And you're faithful to it. You're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain, the Lord. You stand in your place day by day. Christians who want to do what's right, it ends up not being a fly-by-night kind of deal. You become a person who can be depended upon by God Almighty. 
and by your Christian brethren, by church. We can count on this person being where they're supposed to be on a daily basis. That's when God can use you. We've talked about that in the life of Joseph. Be just being steadfast where he was, wherever it is in Scripture. You'll find people who are steadfast, and then all of a sudden here came God's perfect will as they were where they're supposed to be. The problem is we move ahead of God, or we lag way behind God, and God's perfect uh, will for our lives we never meet. If you look at verse um, later in this passage is the prayer of intercession, which is great, and then they have some rejoicing. Amazing time. Uh, but let's look at 31, verse 1. Now when all this was finished, all Israel that were present went out to the cities of Judah and break the images in pieces and cut down the groves and threw down the high places and the altars out of all Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim also and Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned and every man to his possession to their own cities. Here, this people... Because Hezekiah wanted to do what's right, they're all getting right, and this means they're breaking down all the idols in their lives. All the high things that exalt themselves against God in their lives. All the things they put above God. Somebody who wants to do what's right are getting rid of those things. And I want to tell you, I want to teach a little lesson here by God's grace, that sometimes things we put above God, sometimes they can, they can be kind of good things. In worldly terms, they can be pleasant things, nice things. To that point, if you remember, and we don't have to turn there, but 2 Kings 18, a parallel passage to 2 Chronicles 31, it tells us what one of the idols was here that they threw down. You know what it was? One of the idols that they threw down was Nehushtan. Nehushtan, and I've got a little bit of a story here, but Nehushtan was that brazen serpent that Moses created. Remember, I've talked about that. They put that brazen serpent up in the wilderness. They looked at that, look and live, right? It was important. That brazen serpent was important, right? For God's purpose and time and for the, the powerful punch of preaching it, it provides now is amazing. That story of the brazen serpent. But what the people had done with that brazen serpent, they took that good thing and they lifted it up above God and people were actually worshiping it. They were worshiping Nehushtan, that brazen serpent. To me, it teaches the lesson that Christians absolutely are guilty of this. We'll lift up something good up higher than it should be. What, what, are some of those, what could some of those things be? Well, one thing that's good, absolutely is good, is to be a good, strong family. It is. It's good to be a good family man, family woman, right? But I know Christians, and I am inclined myself to put family above God. Right? We've built this strong family. I don't want to see it break up. You know, we've got to look strong for everybody, but oh my goodness, my son's just ruined his life and he's gone into the world. And I have a choice now to make. I can either say, oh, the son is just fine and we're all good. We're that strong family everybody loves. America's family right here. Right? Keep that image of pride and of esteem in the world. Or we can do as the Bible would say, and if someone walks away from the faith, you've got to let them walk. In fact, if he's causing trouble in the family, you've got to separate. Love, who loveth father or son more than me is not worthy of me. Right? Father, daughter. We know that passage, but that's something that's something good. A family is a good thing, but don't put it above God. I love Christians today. There's a, people have turned Sundays, God's day, they've turned those into family days, right? Family day. Well, it's God's day. Let's not put family above God. That's why we, we continue with Sunday night services here because we value the very Word of God. But I know many, 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 many churches, including some decent Baptist ones, have said, you know, Sunday nights have just become into family nights. Well, I love family and have a strong family, but don't, don't put it above God. Other things um, that people put above God. How about biblical intellectualism? Like, I'm a doctrine guy. I love doctrine, right? We as a people, the Bible says that we are to know sound doctrine. We should, and that's what we cover in Sunday school, you know, Wednesday nights, Sunday nights. We'll talk about a lot of doctrine. But Christian friend, I don't ever want us to put biblical intellectualism, the fact that we know some facts above God in your life. Because I want you to know, because you're the same way I am. When I read my Bible during the day, what I need from God is I need from God to clear my, clean my heart. 
I need God to direct my steps. So my daily devotions are ones, I'm not digging in trying to find, you know, here's the deep theological point of, you know, for Calvin, hyper-Calvinism or whatever it may be. I'm not digging in. I'm looking, I'm looking for God to guide me because I need guided. And I'm afraid sometimes as Christians grow, we start to like, we like doctrine, which is good. Love doctrine. Dig into doctrine. But know that you've got to keep feeding yourself as well. Find what God's telling you personally to do. We can put legalism above God, can we not? And I'm all about being moderate in all things, but we should be moderate um, in what we abstain from as well. Just be, be according to Scripture. Some Christians, they think it's a show of godliness that they give something up. And all of a sudden, the fact that they gave something, they changed some standard here. They made their standard so tight in this area. Maybe it's dress code. Maybe it's what goes in their mouth. They made it so tight that... That's what they're glorying in now, instead of the cross. It's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but what comes out of a man's mouth defiles the man. We must keep those things in perspective, or those themselves, which are good. It's good to have some standards, but we'll lift them up above God, and that's not biblical. Tradition. Traditions can be great, but traditions can go above God too. Family traditions. Traditions we create on our own. Um, community traditions. Things we place above God, we need to get them out of our lives. It says in chapter 31 and verse 21, and we're going to get back to the story here real soon. 31.20 says, And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah and wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord his God. Something is on target, right? He did, he did that which was good and right and truth before the Lord is God, and in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, and in the law, and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all his heart and prospered. He did it with all his heart. How do you decide, how do you get your whole heart into something? When you decide to do what's right. You decide to do what's right. It's a decision, that's what I'm saying. If it's a gradual thing, if you're gradually going to get out of that sin, or if you're gradually going to start reading your Bible, or gradually start being um, placed in church um, higher in your life, you're not doing it with all your heart. You're saying, I've got half my heart in this, that's why it needs to be a gradual process. You put your whole heart in something, it's an automatic deal. Amen. I'm going to show up, I'll be there. I'm going to open God's Word, I'll be there. I'm going to pray. I'm going to stand for God. I'm going to speak the truth. I'm all there. All in. All heart. That's how things get done. That's how Hezekiah lived. And that's how Hezekiah sets his life up for true spiritual success. Let's look at um, the next chapter, 32. Just a few verses. And I want you to understand that these, these next eight verses, 2 Chronicles 32, 1-8, through 8, are, are just prior to what we read at the onset with Rabshaka coming um, to meet uh, the messengers. Second Chronicles 32, verse 1. After these things, and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah and camped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. We've got to do these things, put our houses in order, because the battle is coming. And I want to make the point this morning that if Hezekiah had not done what's right, he would not be prepared for this foe that's right now outside of his gates. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city. And they did help him. So he's cutting out the water line to the enemy here. But. So there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? Also he strengthened himself and built up the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without and repaired Milo and the city of David and made darts and shields in abundance and he set captains of war of the people and gathered them together in the, to him in the street of the gate of the city and spake comfortably to them saying be strong and courageous be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria nor for all the multitude is with him for there be more for us than with him now I just want to think that Hezekiah here he did a lot of things to prepare did he not? And he was right in doing so. He was active. He, he took seriously he took seriously the foe that was without the walls. He did. And we should too, Christian friends. 
That's why you're faithful in church. That's why we raise our kids in the things of the Lord. That's why we're in the Word of God, etc., etc., etc. We do all these things. But watch where Hezekiah's heart is at and where his trust is at. And this is where ours should be as well. Verse 8. With him is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. The people rested. This is Hezekiah's sermon right before the foe comes to the walls. This is why those two men remembered Hezekiah's words and said, Hey, we're not supposed to talk to this guy. Hey, this guy shouldn't even be talking to the, to the people, the soldiers back on the walls. He's going to try to get them to um, distrust God. This is the preparation. I preach this sermon because I know today we face foes, right? All of us do in different ways. If we, if we want to do what's right, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you're trying to do what's right, you're going to get some blowback from the world. If you're not, you might not be trying to do what's right. But I, right now we face some foes, but I want to pitch to you this morning that tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, we may face a foe that we've never seen yet. Maybe bigger than the last one. David's foes increased in size, propensity, and, and in danger. Faced the lion and the bear, and then all of a sudden he's standing before nine foot three Goliath. Yeah, we don't know who might be coming next. For us, not just for us, but for our children as well. We need to remember. No man liveth or dieth unto himself. The reason you stay strong is because it helps you, but also because you stay strong, you can help a brother or sister in the Lord stay strong against the foes. And it's important. Okay, this is the prep passage. Now let's go back and let's finish the story um, in the book of Isaiah. Back to Isaiah 37. We'll finish the story to see what happened to Rabshakeh and Hezekiah. All that backstory was to say that when you do what is right, you are ready to face any foe. No worries. And I know my little talk right there might have got us worried about foes, but what I'm saying is if we do what's right, we're ready to face any foe. And let's see how this plays out. We know it's true because we know how this plays out. Look at Isaiah 37 and verse 21. For the sake of time, I might pick and choose a little bit here. 37 verse 1 says, And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went to the house of the Lord. Now remember, this is right after Rabshakeh gave all his threats, tried to get all the children of Israel to turn on God, to distrust Hezekiah himself. Hezekiah has every reason right now to be completely freaking out. He Maybe he is, but you see where he goes. He went to the house of the Lord. A refuge, safe place to renew his thoughts on God. When you got a problem, get in God's house, I'll say very plainly. Verse 2, And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and of blasphemy, for the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. In other words, as I understand that, it means like a child is ready to be born. The children of Israel are ready to stand on their own two feet, but it's going to be, uh, they're not going to live through the process. It's going to be a stillbirth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria has master, his master has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left. Hezekiah says we need to start praying. Get Isaiah, get Isaiah, get everybody on board. We need to pray. It may be that God will turn this huge foe back around. Five, so the servants of the king of Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus shall you say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own hand. Isaiah, the man of God, he can answer with specifics, right? Amen. We can answer with specifics. When people are discouraged, I should, as a pastor, should be able to provide you specifics of just trust God. Your finances are going to be okay. Just trust God. Your health is going to be okay. We can see from Scripture how this plays out. You need to be able to provide that, provide that to your circles. Specifics, that's what Isaiah is good for here. 8. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libya, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And he heard say coming 
concerning Terkaka, the king of Ethiopia, he has come forth to make war with thee, and when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given unto the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done unto all the lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Again, trying to cast doubt. Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rizleth, and the children of Eden, which which were in Telassar, and where the, where the king of Hamath, the king of Arphad, and the king of the city of um, Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva. Again, I'm reading all these, and I want to just read them, even though I'm stumbling through them, to say that the world, the foe, has its argument in place. They know what to say. They know how to tell you that, you know, this is not going to work out for you. Your kids are going to resent the fact that you brought them to Sunday school so many times. You know, your relationship's going to fall apart. Um, you're, you're, you need to be able to work on Sundays. Oh, your finances are going to fall apart if you can't work double, triple overtime on Sunday morning, right? They know the lines. I don't, they know the lines a lot better than I do to, tell, to get you to doubt and get you to think that you need to take and lean onto the arm of flesh when all you need is Almighty God to lift you up. Again, what's Hezekiah's answer? It's the same as Jesus' answer was. Jesus always was praying. Jesus was always quoting scripture when Satan came around. 14, And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed in the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, all, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Hezekiah takes this letter from Rabshakeh and he spreads it out before the Lord. Liken this to your lives when the devil casts doubt in your hearts, in your minds. Bring those things straight out and present them right before the Lord. Drag them out. Show them to God. In 17, incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries. He's saying, this problem is real, God. It's true. The Syrians, they've, they've killed everybody. They have not been beaten. It's a, it's a real problem. But you see what he does here, which I think is important? He says, which has sent to reproach the living God. Do you know who you have on your side when you choose to do what's right? You have the living God. When you know who you have on your side when you choose to obey God's word? The living God. So anything that the world does against you is then against God, right? You know a scary place to be as a Christian? Living your life outside of the will of God. Because then if the world does something against you, they're just reproaching you in your fleshly, backslidden state. You're receiving not righteous persecution. You're just, you're just messed up. You're fighting with the world on your own terms. If we're in the center of God's will, obeying God's word, then when the world comes against us, they're coming against Almighty God. And guess what? You don't win against Almighty God. Let's look down to... Um, we'll skip a little bit here again for the sake of time. It says... It says in um, verse 21, Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. Isaiah goes on to tell the words that they're going to speak to Sennacherib, that Sennacherib, this is not going to work out good for you. And in fact, he gives a full prophecy saying that how this is going to be your downfall of you personally as well, um, the king of Assyria. I, I would like to skip, if we could, down to verse 33. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Again, not to belabor the point, but God will win this battle because it's for His own sake. He's not going to let the wicked blaspheme. He's going to say, those people who have trusted in me, are trusted in me, are serving me, they represent me. You, Christian friend, you are an ambassador of Christ. You're sent from Almighty God. Don't have to sweat the small stuff. 
36. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. That's the power of God. One angel goes in there, kills a hundred and forty, excuse me, hundred and eighty-five thousand. 37. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch his god, that Adramelech and Sherezer his son smote him with the sword, and they escaped in the land of Armenia, and Ezraheda and his son reigned in his stead. This was prophesied by Isaiah that Sennacherib would in fact die by the hand of his own sons in his own temple. It did not work out well. It did not work out well for the enemy. And those who work against the cause of Christ, it never works out well. But that's not the point of the message today. The point of the message is that this story never works out well for Hezekiah unless he had decided to do what was right. Decided to do what was right. He was a man who wanted to do what's right. I ask you, are you? To bring us back to that starting question. And God's ask, who shall I send? It's simply a question of, do you want to do what's right? Pray that God will work in our lives, yours and mine. Of course, doing what's right ultimately begins with coming to know the Savior. We talked about that in Sunday school. It's that decision to finally accept Christ for your sin. The Bible says that the world, the world we go about to establish our own righteousness and we've not submitted ourselves in the righteousness of God. I preached that sermon that says that if you think that your, your goodness in some way, shape, or form is going to get you into heaven, then you don't know the God that we serve. You don't know the Savior that died on the cross for your sin. You don't know how salvation works. You don't know how vile our sin is and that our works could never outweigh our sin in any way, shape, or form. You sin in one way, you're guilty of all. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you use this morning's sermon on the story of Hezekiah to remind the saint, the Christian, um, that we should simply choose to do what's right and be fervent about it. Put all of our hearts into it, Lord, because we know there's the safest place to be in the center of your will. And Lord, on the flip side, we know for Christians who have chosen here and there to not do what's right, we're playing with fire and we're setting ourselves up to stand on weak turf when the enemy may arrive any day. Pray, Lord, you help us be sober, be vigilant, fight against the wiles of the devil, and Lord, that we'd ever trust in you more and more as the days grow darker. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.